Now we move on to our step three, which is our last step. In this step, we're going to compare this expectation with the average 1 over x times and after that we compare this with the original f without epsilon it's not hard to see uh, those two terms are very close to each other this f epsilon differs from fn only by a magnitude of epsilon so let's see why this expectation is close to this average to this end we shall compare first the expectation of the individual term with this average this part is a little bit tedious but not hard I could leave this to you as an exercise but I don't want to do so so you may want to pause this video to think it on yourself why they are close to each other but I will give you the details anyway this YouTube channel is aimed at providing mathematical details so I don't want to skip any details okay why are they close to each other we simply look at their difference this difference is let me explicitly write out what this means next we're gonna carefully split those two sums the basic idea is try to align them with each other and uh, let's continue splitting this and now we regroup them into three parts using triangular inequality okay now we get one two and three three parts we're going to show they are all very small when x is big those three parts are very small when when x goes to infinity all due to one reason that if you look at its average this is always bounded by one. Specifically, the first part is to be equal. So you multiply x plus i and divide by x plus i. So this average when you magnify the i in the numerator to m notice that this i is always bounded by m i here is always bounded by m so this is less than or equal to and 
and this guy is bounded by 1. Well, this guy looks at 0 as x goes to infinity. So to summarize, this is a little o of 1 as x goes to infinity. And likewise, for the second and third parts, they both go to zero as x goes to infinity. So, summarizing this, we get this expectation is almost the same as the sum plus an error term, and that error term goes to zero when x goes to infinity. And there's a dependence on m. This is true for each i greater or equal to 1 less than or equal to m. So we have so I have found the error for this difference when x goes to infinity. Now how about this? How about the comparison of this guy is this average? This is immediate because if you look at this average, it differs from this guy still by the same error. Since there will be m many such errors, we will sum of, sum of them up and we will divide it by m, that still give you the same error. So we are going to get the same. And now we are ready to finish the proof. Now we are ready to combine the estimates we gave and finish this proof. We have this estimate just derived and recall from the above. From the step number two, we got to estimate this. So this is from step three. And this is from step two. Now, combining these two, what do we know about this sum? We know this sum would be bounded by x times 2 epsilon plus some error terms. Now, we would like to get rid of this m by choosing m to be a large integer. How large? We just need m to be large enough so that the condition for zero entropy is satisfied. So 
we want to make m large enough so that there's a cover by this many balls of radius epsilon. This will guarantee this bound for S sub m so that we are going to have this bound for the probability and therefore the bound for this expectation namely the result in step number 2. So fix m Remember this m will depend on epsilon and f large enough to apply the definition of zero entropy. The zero entropy, recall this is same as saying f is deterministic. So that Step two is valid. Now we can combine these two into one term. There's a dependency on epsilon and f. Now let's go back to f instead of f epsilon. Since by construction, they only differ by epsilon. The triangular inequality shows that thing without epsilon will be less than or equal to x times 3 epsilon plus this small error. Are we done at this point? Compare with what is stated in Sanat's conjecture. Recall that Sanat's conjecture says this guy is little as x goes to infinity of x. Now we have a dependence on epsilon. How do we get rid of this dependence on epsilon? That is the question. You can say, now let epsilon be a function of x that goes to zero as x goes to infinity. If epsilon goes to zero sufficiently slow as x goes to infinity, then hopefully this term will be a little of x. If you are really strong in analysis, that probably something really easy for you. But uh, I'm going to show you all the details. And I will show you how to realize this rigorously. To show that rigorously, we need the following lemma. This lemma is just elementary real analysis. Let capital F be a real function with two positive real variables x and y. Suppose for any y greater than zero limit of x comma y goes to zero as 
x equals infinity. The limit is zero when x goes infinity. Then there exists a positive function g equals g of x such that number one the limit of g of x as x goes to infinity is zero well, at the same time, you still have this function goes to zero. When you take y to be g of x, when x goes to infinity. OK, this is uh, this lemma. Lemma is not hard to prove. We'll construct this g of x as a piecewise function. First, we'll find x1 greater than 0 such that because this limit is 0, We can choose this x1 so large that f of x comma 1 is bounded by 1 for all x greater or equal to x1. And now find x2 greater than x1 so that f of x comma one half is less than one half for all x greater or equal to x two, and we continue in this way. In general, we can obtain an increasing sequence. of points x sub n in such a way that for all x greater or equal to x n we have these functions F sub value bounded by 1 over n. And at the same time, the limit of this sequence goes to infinity. Now let the g, g of x we want to be the following piecewise function from 0 to x1, its value is 1. And on the interval from xn to xn plus 1, we'll make sure its value is 1 over n. I will sum this up. Now, g of x will have limit 0 as x goes to infinity. And the limit of f of x, g of x will be 0 based on our construction. That is because 
if x falls into interval from xn to xn plus 1, then g of x will be equal to 1 over n. 1 over n. And because x is greater or equal to xn, in that case, f of x, 1 over n, will be bounded by 1 over n. So, when x goes to infinity, this f of x, g of x will be 0. So we get the conclusion we want. And we're done. With the proof of this lemma. Now how does this lemma apply to our setting? So in our case of the proof of Sanas conjecture, we're going to take this part to be our function f of x comma epsilon. This is the real function, a function with real value, with two positive real variables, x and epsilon. x and epsilon are both greater than zero. And for any epsilon greater than zero, the limit of this as x goes to infinity is indeed zero, because this is little o of one when x goes to infinity. By our lemma, there exists a positive function g equal to g of x. So epsilon will be able to be written as a function of x so that This f of x comma g of x will go to zero as, as, as x goes to infinity, while at the same time g of x will go to zero as x goes to infinity. So, so this part is three times g of x. So the whole thing will go to zero as x goes to infinity. And there's also dependence on f. Don't forget. So this part is indeed a little o of x as x goes to infinity. And we are done with the proof of Sanat's conjecture with the help of this lemma.